Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Justin Hunter, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to take the time to join us here on our YouTube channel. Maybe you're watching on Facebook or even perhaps listening in on Spotify, but we're so grateful that you've taken the time to join us. We've got some rich, wonderful content that we want to share tonight. And friends, let me tell you something. Strap in your spiritual seatbelts because we're going to be talking about a subject that is mind-boggling to me. I want to talk about dealing with demons, dealing with demons. Now, if we were to do an incredible deep dive on this subject, it would be a four-hour video. Most people don't want to watch a four-hour video. So what I'm going to do in this session is I'm just going to give you some basic information when it comes to dealing with demons. You know, friends, usually when we think about demons and we think about the spirit realm, we don't think so much about an invisible spirit. We think more like Hollywood. You know, we think about these grotesque monsters as demons and things like that. We don't really think of a demonic spirit as being an invisible entity that literally can influence people to try and cause people to do things. And in some cases can actually cause people to do things. So we want to sort of change our perspective on this. Let's take off our modern 21st century worldview glasses and let's take off our Hollywood glasses here in the West. And instead, let's put on our ancient worldview glasses and let's look at this subject of dealing with demons the way that people in the Bible would have looked at it, the way they would have viewed it and what they thought about it. So nonetheless, demonic spirits are very real. And so in this session, I want to cover some of the following. Number one, I want to talk about the two types of demonic encounters that we will face in life. You know, as believers, as Christians especially, we are going to encounter demonic spirits. I've been, uh, this month will be 25 years uh, as of this recording that I've been ordained in the gospel ministry and I have seen some demonic activity uh, in my 25 years. I've seen both sides of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the two types of demonic encounters. Uh, we're also going to talk about demons and illness. There seems to be, in some cases, not all cases, in some cases, a correlation between mental, physical illness and uh, demonic, uh, you know, uh, activity. So dealing with demons in that way. Then we're going to talk about uh, can a demon hurt a Christian? Okay. And I want to also focus in on how a lot of times demonic spirits are very opportunistic. Okay. And, and what do I mean by that? So most of the time, you know, we think about a demonic spirit. If you're driving to work and you have a flat tire on your car, don't think that a demon gave you a flat tire. That's, that's not the case. You may have ran over something in your driveway or on the road. However, because you're running a little bit late and because you now have a flat tire and you're on the side of the road, stress begins to build up. You begin to get stressed. Now, this demonic spirit who had no control over the tire going flat had no control over you running a little bit late, now sees the stress level in you going up. And it's an opportunity, okay, are you with me, to try and cause you extra pain, to try to make you more afraid, try to make your anxiety levels come up. You say, Pastor Hunter, are you sure about that? Friends, I'm telling you, I'm going to give you some scripture tonight that's going to boggle your mind. So a lot of times when it comes to dealing with demons, friends, it's not going to be so much that you're always going to be face to face with them and you're going to talk to them and they're going to talk back in this creepy voice like you see in the movies. It's not going to happen like that. A lot of times what's going to happen is you're going to have a series of things happen to you that causes you to become stressed out, causes you to become angry, causes you to become upset. And a lot of demonic spirits are very opportunistic. They, they didn't necessarily cause those things. But when those things happen, they sort of capitalize on those things. So that's something important to remember. I think all believers and all Christians and people need to understand that. Just because something happens to you doesn't mean that this demon spirit did it. The devil doesn't always do it, okay? Sometimes things just happen because we live in a, a natural world where things are imperfect. And sometimes things happen. But again... A lot of demonic spirits are opportunistic. They're opportunists. They will wait and, and they will notice that you are in a very stressful situation, 
a high stress or you know something like that, and that's when they move in, trying to cause us to have thoughts in our mind or feelings on the inside, feelings of anxiety, anger, or you know sometimes hate, or I want to get that person back, or this person made me mad, I want to get them back. So the demon didn't make the person make you mad, but when you got mad, th that demonic spirit took advantage of that. So that's some cases, okay? Those are some cases of uh, whenever we are going to deal with demons, there's going to be cases like that. Now, there are other cases when we deal with demonic spirits that we're going to be dealing with people that we have no idea and we don't know that we're dealing with demonic spirits. In fact, uh, it reminds me of a passage in the New Testament where Jesus looked at one of his disciples, Peter as a matter of fact, and said, get thee behind me, Satan. And when you read that passage, you think to yourself, well, Jesus is obviously addressing the devil, but why is he saying that to Peter? Is he trying to say Peter is the devil? No, not at all. Because in a previous passage, Jesus also said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desire to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that you'll be strong. So when Peter rebuked Jesus, he understood that that was an emotion from Peter that was being brought out by the devil. So Jesus looks at Satan and says, get thee behind me, Satan. So oftentimes these uh, emotions will come up and things will come up this way and spirits interact in that way. Now, there are two main ways or two consistent ways that we will deal with demons. Number one is demonic oppression, okay? Number two is demonic possession. You've got oppression and possession. Now, what is the difference? Let me explain. Demonic oppression, and by the way, you can read about demonic oppression in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. It mentions that they brought many people to Jesus who were being oppressed by demonic spirits. Sometimes they would bring people who were actually possessed, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So what is demonic oppression? Let me ask you this question. As a believer or even as a non-believer, have you ever been going along through life normal and everything is fine, but suddenly you find yourself feeling very strange and weird, and then you start feeling like you're depressed for no reason whatsoever? It's not that it's some seasonal thing or the changing of the weather or whatever. Or whatever. It seems that for some reason, out of the blue, just you start having these really strange feelings. Sometimes, not every time, sometimes that is demonic oppression. That's when a spirit or spirits are pushing down on you. They're pressing down in your life, okay? Uh, you can read about this in the Old Testament. Whenever King Saul had uh, gotten on the wrong side of God for trying to kill David, a uh, man after God's own heart, God sent a demonic spirit to torment King Saul. And the only way that that spirit would leave him alone is whenever David would actually uh, play the harp. And so we find an instance there of a spirit not possessing Saul, but oppressing Saul, pushing down on him. And he was the king of Israel. So friend, if a spirit can do that to a king of Israel, he can certainly do that to you and I. Now, what is the result of demonic oppression, okay, when we're, op when we're oppressed by demonic spirits? Well, there can, there can be several different consequences. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, we can find ourselves going into a little bit of a, a funk or a depression, if you will. Uh, sometimes we can develop uh, a higher anxiety level because we feel we're being oppressed. I know some of you are watching this right now saying, Pastor, you are talking to me. I know. I understand. Sometimes whenever we're demonically oppressed, it affects us in mental ways, right? It causes us to think things that really aren't logical. We become sometimes paranoid when we don't have any reason to be. We sometimes think that people are out to get us when there's no reason to think that at all. And so demonic oppression can come in different forms. Sometimes when people have experienced very traumatic things, it opens up a door for demonic oppression and even in some cases possession, which we'll talk about momentarily. But you know, when we're talking about oppression, that's the pushing down on a person by a spirit or spirits. And you could basically look at it this way. It's a demonic spirit working from the outside, trying to push you in. It's not in you working out of you. It's outside of you trying to work inside of you. 
Now, what is the result of this? Well, I, I said depression, anxiety, things like that. You know, it can affect you mentally and in, in, in that. But I also believe that if a person does not get any help for that demonic oppression, that over a period of time, enough things can happen to where there may be a door there for the second type of interaction that we have, and that's people who are suffering from demonic possession. Now, demonic possession is not like what you would typically think it would be in Hollywood. You know, you watch these movies, and a person that's quote-unquote possessed, they've got this grotesque look on their face, their head is spinning around, and all of that silly stuff. That is not what you're going to encounter with someone who is demonically possessed. Let me explain how this works. A demonically possessed person oftentimes will have no idea that they are possessed in any way. They have no clue. Some people will completely black out and do things, and when they come to, they have no idea what they did. You say, well, that could be a medical condition. It could be. It very well could be. But it could also be a form of demonic possession. When a demon spirit has taken root and taken hold inside of a person, it can cause that person to act out in different ways. We see this all over the Bible. This was, <coughs> excuse me, not just the view of the ancient people, but it's also the view of even many modern scholars in, in today's world. So understand that demonic oppression and demonic possession, while they are different, they're very, very, very similar. And a lot of people will ask me, well, Pastor Ken, a demon possess a Christian? Some people would say yes, and they would cite, you know, uh, Judas. They would say that Judas was treated like one of the 12. He was a chosen and so on and so forth. But, you know, he, he became possessed. Satan entered him and so on and so forth. Other people would say, no, 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 no. That's not right because the Holy Spirit lives inside of a believer and sweet water and sour water cannot dwell in the same well. You say, well, what's your, what's your opinion on it, Pastor Hunter? Here's my opinion. Are you ready? My opinion is whether or not a demon spirit can oppress or possess a Christian is sort of irrelevant if that demonic spirit can get that believer to do or accomplish what that spirit wants that person to accomplish. Let me say that all again. It doesn't really matter at, one, at some point because if a demonic spirit is oppressing me, and causing me to respond in the way that that spirit wants me to respond, then that spirit is successful. If a spirit is possessing me and causes me to act, behave, or respond in a way that that spirit wants me to act, behave, and respond, then that Christian, that, that demonic spirit inside of that Christian has won. So let's just say for a moment, let's just say that a demon cannot possess a Christian. Let's just say that, okay, can't happen. Can they be oppressed? Absolutely. Demon spirits can oppress Christians. So if that spirit can get you to do what that spirit wants you to do, does it really make any difference? That's something you'll have to decide. Possession from inside. There are times when, and again, I want to be careful how I say this. Not every time. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a medical doctor. I am an ordained minister, and uh, I've been studying this subject for 20 plus years, I can say this, n not in every case, absolutely not in every case. Sometimes it's just something that the person cannot help. But I also believe that there are some cases, notice what I said, some cases in which mental illness, acts of violence, hatred, addiction, things like that could be the result of demonic oppression or possession, either or. You may recall reading a story in the Bible about a fellow who was possessed. I'm going to read that story for you. It comes actually from the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. And this man was actually possessed. But what made this unique was it doesn't appear that he was possessed by just one spirit. It appears that he was possessed by multiple spirits. You say, now, Pastor Hunter, can that really happen? Well, let me remind you what Jesus said. Jesus said that... Um, a person who um, had an unclean spirit in them, when they are delivered, 
their house, that is their inner self, is all cleaned up, and that spirit will walk in dry places seeking rest but finding none. What is dry places? It's the Judean wilderness. I don't have time to unpack all that, but the Judean wilderness. But then Jesus says this. He says, after a period of time, that spirit will return and will bring seven more spirits stronger than him. And if the house is still clean and if the house is still guarded, then that spirit won't get in. But if that house, if that, if you let that spirit back in, he'll bring seven more worse than himself. That's why Jesus said on a couple occasions when he would heal people, he would say, go and send no more because the latter condition of you will be worse than the first. So in the gospel of Mark chapter number five, we discover that Jesus encounters a man who is possessed not just by one spirit, but by more than one spirit. Just like that one I read you a moment ago where he brings seven more stronger than him. Here is an instance where a man is possessed by more than one spirit. So I'm going to read this for you beginning in Mark chapter 5 and verse number 1. They came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now let me just stop for a moment and say this. Demonic spirits, spirits are referenced in different ways by different authors in the Bible. Some of them call them unclean spirits. Some of them call them familiar spirits. Even our brother, the Apostle Paul, categorized the spirit realm for us. He talked about in Ephesians chapter 6, principalities, and then powers, and then rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Go back and watch our video on the mystery of the high places. That'll blow you away. So here it says, this man came to him who had an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. I want you to notice that this man is not thinking right. He's living among the tombs, among the dead. Then it goes on to say, no one could bind him, not even with chains, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles into pieces. Notice this man was possessed, we're going to find out later, by more than one spirit. And as a result, he had a paranormal type of a strength. Again, the violence, the anger, that sort of thing coming out in a person could be a sign of, I'm not saying that it is, I'm saying it could be a sign of what this man was going through. It said, no one had the strength to subdue him. Verse number five, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. Now, I want to say this, friends. There are many people out there that are suffering on the inside from either demonic oppression or even possibly demonic possession, and they're suffering silently. You and I don't see it, but they're crying at night. They're crying out to God. This man was cutting himself. He, was, he had a spirit of suicide in him that wanted him to just cut himself and hurt himself, and he lived among the tombs. He wasn't thinking right. No one wanted to be around him. The people looked at him as you know, being a bad person. This guy's a, a bad person. And maybe some of you are watching going, Pastor Hunter, I feel the same way in my life. I feel alienated like that guy did. I want you to know there's hope for you, and his name is Jesus. He will set you free and heal you and make you whole again and make you new. And you want me to prove it to you from his word? Let's just keep on reading what happened. It goes on in verse 6 to say, after he cut himself night and day with stones, and when he saw Jesus from afar off, he ran and fell down before him. There was something in this man, including these demonic spirits, that recognized who Jesus was. Now, there's a great controversial debate over whether Jesus Christ existed prior to his birth, his natural birth. Some people would say no. Some people would say yes. It's interesting, however, that demonic spirits who live in the spirit realm recognized who he was. Even in flesh, they recognized him. In fact, in uh, Matthew chapter 8 here in verse number 29, they actually asked the, Jesus the question, have you come to torment us before our time? Like, how did they know about all that? You know, uh, so that's just something to consider. But let's just go on and see what else it says. In verse 7, he cried with a loud voice. He said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? This spirit inside of him recognized the position of Jesus Christ called him the son of the most high. 
Jesus Christ, the absolute, unique Son of God, no other like Him. And notice what He says, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For He was saying unto Him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirits. I want you to notice what's happening here. Jesus is having a conversation with this man, and He is speaking to the demonic spirit. The man, I don't think, even recognizes what's going on at the moment. Jesus is talking to a demonic spirit that is in him. They're having this conversation. These spirits are terrified of Jesus. I want you to notice the authority that Christ has over these spirits. There is a great amount of authority that our Lord Jesus Christ displays over these demonic spirits. Now remember, demons are not the same as a principality. Demons aren't the same as a power. Demons are in a different category. There's different types of demons that specialize in different things. This man had a spirit of suicide in him. But understand, they're all under the subject of the Lord Jesus Christ. All authority has been given to him, the Bible says. God gave all authority to Christ. He's the one that's going to judge in Matthew 25. He's the one that rules and reigns. He is the one that they tremble at his feet. Notice what it says here. What have you to do with me, thou Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg of you by God, do not torment me. For the Lord Jesus was saying to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. This is not a mistranslation. In the Greek manuscript, it reads the same way. So Legion was the name of the chief spirit that was possessing this man. But there were multiple spirits in him, and he is saying to Jesus, my name is Legion, we are many. Why did this demonic spirit take upon himself the name of Legion? There's many different theories as to why a spirit takes upon itself a certain name or a certain title. In this instance, from where the man who was possessed was living, there was a road that went past the Sea of Galilee and up into the mountains there. And uh, there was a Roman legion of soldiers that would march up that road in the morning and down that road in the evening. It's believed that it's possible that this demonic spirit could have taken its name from a legion of soldiers that prepare for battle. In other words, they're warriors. They go to battle. So they call, they call themselves legion legion okay uh, other people would say no pastor hunter that's just one spirit but later we're going to find that it has an effect on more than just one being so jesus says what is your name he says my name is legion for we are many now i want you to know what happens then the spirit the demonic spirit named legion begged jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country in other words, please do not send us back to the dry places. Remember, the disciples asked Jesus, where do demonic spirits go when they leave a person? Jesus says they walk through dry places. They seek rest, but they find none. Why is that the Judean wilderness? I'm not going to dive off into that. It has to do with the sin goat and the scapegoat. It has to do with the uh, a watcher named Azazel and all of that stuff. There's a whole history behind the Judean wilderness and evil spirits, but I'm not going to go there. I digress. This spirit is begging Jesus, do not send me away there. But watch what Jesus says. The spirit says rather, the spirit rather begged him saying, send us into the pigs, into the swine and let us enter into them. Notice there's more than one spirit. There's one spokesman and he is speaking on behalf of them all. And he's answering Jesus saying, please don't send us to the dry places. Let us go into these swine. What is it about a demonic spirit that craves to inhabit a body? They don't have a physical body. They cannot produce within themselves a physical body. There is a difference between an angel and a demon. Even if you want to call it a fallen angel, there's a difference between that and a demon. Angels have bodies. They may not live in their first estate, the fallen ones, but they have bodies. They can change. They can look like a human. They can look like a spirit. They have abilities and powers that just a regular demonic spirit does not have. Where do demons come from? Are there a completely different created subcategory? Sort of. It depends on how you read the Old Testament. There's passages in the Old Testament, a Hebrew manuscript, the old manuscript, 
in Hebrew and Aramaic that would lead you to believe that demonic spirits may have been the spirits that came out of the giants when they died. I can't prove that. I don't know for sure. But I know this. Demonic spirits are very real. They inhabit the world that we live in. We come in contact with them way more frequently than what we think. And then we're constantly engaging in spiritual warfare, whether we realize it or not. And again, I said a moment ago, there's two types of main interaction, and that's going to be demonic oppression, demonic possession. This man is possessed. He's asking Jesus to let us go into the swine. Now, I want to prove to you this is a spirit of suicide, because not only was the man cutting himself, watch what happens next. So in verse 13, Jesus gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd numbering about 2,000. I want you to notice that. About 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. You say, Pastor Hunter, why in the world would Jesus Christ send those spirits into those swine knowing that that was going to happen? Well, let me just give you two things. Number one, Jesus is basically he's doing two things at once here. Number one, he's delivering the man who was possessed with multiple spirits. That's the first thing he does. He delivers him and sets him free. The second thing that happens is in the area where they lived, they were offering swine on the altar to the Greek god Zeus. Jesus just eliminated all of Zeus's offerings in in one swoop. It's kind of interesting that that happened. But in reality, there's a third thing that happened. And that third thing is perhaps the most impactful thing. This man's life was changed, and the people of that village saw it and saw the result of it. I want to read to you what happened here. It said in verse 14, The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and into the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there clothed, And in his right mind, notice what it says. Prior, when this man was fully possessed, he was out of his mind. He wasn't clothed. It would appear to us as a form of mental illness. Jesus heals this man of demonic possession, and suddenly he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. He's talking normal. He's having a rational conversation. He's been set free. This is one example of demonic possession. A lot of times, if you encounter someone who's demonically possessed, you won't necessarily know it right off the bat. And you may never even know it because oftentimes that spirit will remain concealed until that spirit comes out and begins to work through that person. Sometimes the person who is possessed will never even know it. It's far more common to see demonic oppression than it is possession because possession comes as a result of an elongated period of oppression. And so there's a lot of mechanical moving parts when it comes to demonic possession and things like that. And and people have asked me before, can can demons uh, possess animals and things like that? I really don't know the answer to that question. Maybe, maybe not. I really don't know. Everybody's going to have a different opinion on that. It's really irrelevant for this particular conversation because it's people that we're talking about it. We're talking about, you know, dealing with demons. How do we in the world as Christians deal with this? Well, first off, we have to be made aware of it. We can't live in this imaginary world where demons are these little harmless green elves that are over here doing their thing and angels are over here doing their things. It's not like that at all. We have to be aware that the spirit world is all around us and that there are demonic spirits all around us. There are spirits around us that are loyal to God, There are, uh, but there are demonic spirits all around us. Sometimes they oppress us, sometimes they oppress other people, and in some occasions they possess people. But just remember that you know, when we walk with the Lord, when we're obedient, when we serve God, when we live for God, then you know, He is dwelling in us. We have that opportunity to have authority over the enemy. See, one of the reasons that people do not believe, excuse me, that a demonic spirit can possess an actual Christian is because Christians have, who are in Christ, have that same authority over demonic spirits that Jesus had. The difference is a lot of Christians simply don't know they have that authority. They don't know, and they wouldn't know how to use it. 
Now, I want to give you something real quick before we close that's not really a part of my planned uh, talk tonight or my planned discussion, but it's something that I want to remind you of. If you feel like that you are the victim of demonic oppression or even perhaps possession, I want to give you some um, advice, okay? I want to give you some words of encouragement. Number one, number one, you should pray. You should do the very best that you can, can to pray to God. The true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, do your very best to pray. And when you pray, I would pray and I would cry out to the Lord just like this man did. And I would say, Lord, I'm hurting and I'm in pain. Please save me. Please change me. Please help me. If, if you will call on God and ask him for deliverance, he will deliver you. But friend, I want to warn you. If God delivers you from some type of demonic oppression, let's just say it's an addiction, for example. Let's say that the reason you struggle with addiction is because you're under a heavy oppression from the enemy. You're not demon-possessed, but you're really oppressed, right? If you're struggling in that area, God can and God will deliver you. But watch, if you go back to that it's just like the scripture said, he'll bring seven more stronger than before. The temptation will be greater and it'll be much more difficult to be delivered if you allow that to come back into your life. So take heed and take warning that if you're going to ask God for deliverance, you have to be serious about God. You have to be serious about changing your life. You have to be serious about wanting deliverance. So, okay, so that's number one. Number two, I would encourage you to read Psalm 91 and pray that out loud, read it out loud in your home, in your home. Go through your room and read Psalm 91. Now, why Psalm 91? The, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran caves in the 40s, we found out that they were a collection of biblical manuscripts and they included a lot of other things that we don't necessarily find in our 66 canonized texts. But we find a lot of interesting ancient Near East literature that we can read and draw upon. And one of the things that we found out through the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the Old Testament in particular, uh, when we got our English translation and we compared that to uh, the Hebrew translation in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found that there were a few small editations that had been made by the Masoretes in the Masoretic text. And one of the things that had been edited was, in some places they will combine uh, like different passages, whereas we have them parceled out by chapters and verses. Um, but in some places we find that they completely, there's some places that have been omitted. Like I'll give you an example. Psalm 91 is actually an exorcism passage, okay? Um, but there, there were four other Psalms attached to Psalm 91 that did not make it into our English Bible. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why. I won't go into that tonight. But there's four additional Psalms, okay, attached to Psalm 91. But I would encourage you just to read Psalm 91 because that is, in fact, an exorcism passage as well as those other four. But uh, we don't have those in our English Bible. But I would encourage you to read Psalm 91. I would encourage you to pray in your home. Do the very best you can to pray to God and listen you have to really mean it. You're going to have to have faith to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe in God, to believe that he can and will deliver you. And don't, don't get deliverance from God and then think, okay, I'm good now. I don't need God no more. It doesn't work like that. If you don't maintain a relationship with the creator, this demonic oppression will never cease. The enemy never rests and he never gets tired. So the great news is, God can and he will deliver you if you're being demonically oppressed, if you feel like you're being demonically possessed and things like that. Now, one of the questions that I often get is, can a demon spirit harm someone physically? There is a passage in the New Testament where a non-believer was posing to be a believer and they encountered someone who was demonically possessed and this demon spirit came out of this person, like manifested through this person, I should say. And said, you know, I recognize Paul and I recognize this other believer, but I, I don't even know you. I don't even know your name. And the man physically, because of this demonic spirit, at attacked that non-believer. Now, you know, we have instances where things like that happen, but I really can't speak on the depth as to how that happens or how often that could or couldn't happen. I, don't, I really don't know. 
But if you feel like you're the victim of any type of demonic oppression, there is deliverance for you and there is hope. But just let me encourage you, stay faithful to God, keep believing, keep serving, and keep walking with Him. And if you do that, I'm telling you, it's going to really help you when it comes time to deal with demons. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but I have just had a great time discussing this subject with you. My hope and prayer is, is that you have uh, received some rich, wonderful content that will actually help you in your day-to-day -day life as you uh, sh going about life and you have to deal with these demons. Remember, every time you conquer some, you know, devil, there's always going to be another one. You know, when God promotes you to a new level, you'll have to fight a new devil, you know, but just stay faithful, keep living for God, keep serving the Lord. And he'll walk you with you all the way to the end. Well, listen, until we meet again, I'm Pastor Justin Hunter. I love you. I appreciate you. We're praying for you. May God bless you is my prayer.